Suppose our company, company A, deals with the end customer in a supply chain. The demand in this market has been quite steady over the past several weeks. However, since it is the end of the quarter and we want to pad our numbers, we decide to offer a promotion. We expect that the demand will spike upwards for a brief period. However, once customers have purchased a larger than usual quantity of our product, they will stay away for a while. So demand will drop briefly. After that, once again, we forecast that demand will return to its normal steady pattern. To produce our product, we deal with our supplier, company B. Normally, we order five truckloads of some component each week. This week, however, we order 12 truckloads. Naturally, the representative from company B is curious, but we remain poker-faced and say, none of your business. We provide only the bare minimum information required, such as the quantity required and our timetable. Next week, we repeat the 12 truckloads order, and then again the following week. But we don't tell company B anything in advance. Why are we so reluctant to provide any information to company B? That's obvious. They are the enemy. Why would you want to provide information to someone who operates under the credo, any information you provide can and will be used against you? So why are they operating under that credo? That's obvious. To keep our suppliers on their toes, we make sure to frequently conduct competitive bidding wars and select the cheapest suppliers. There's a good chance that tomorrow we might not be doing business with company B. So they have zero loyalty to us. If they can gain any information to apply against us during the bidding process, they will make maximum use of it. Also, knowingly or unknowingly, they might end up passing along the information to our competitors. There's only so much that a non-disclosure clause in the contract can help us against an antagonistic supplier. This kind of relationship with our suppliers is called a competitive orientation. When we go into the negotiating room, if there's $10 on the table at the beginning of the session, at the end, the $10 is in one of our pockets. So, if they win, we lose. And if we win, they lose. That is, we are playing a zero-sum game. The gain of one party is the loss of the other party, so the sum is zero. Company B now goes on to order its supplies from Company C. Normally, they order two truckloads of some supplies each week. This week, they look at their inventory levels and decide to continue the same two truckloads order. Next week, however, when they see that we are continuing our increased demand, they decide to place a much larger order to catch up for last week as well. Naturally, they don't pass on any of this information to Company C either. Company C buys some supplies from Company D. Normally, they order six truckloads of some supplies each week. When they see Company B's larger order, they decide to order 10 truckloads from Company D. Meanwhile, when we continue our increased ordering for a third week, Company B figures that we must be on to something. They decide to go to the bank, take out a loan, buy new equipment, and hired more people. Likewise, companies C and D also add more capacity. Now let us see what the demand pattern looks like when it reaches company D. Our steady pattern was broken by one blip, but it soon came back to normal. The demand pattern that company D sees is entirely different. Firstly, the demand pattern is not so steady to start with, Secondly, the blip hits after a delay. Thirdly, the blip is amplified. Fourthly, the blip does not end after one cycle. Rather, 
the demand roller coaster swings up and down for several cycles before calming down. Thus, a small fluctuation in demand at a downstream point in the supply chain gets translated into a huge roller coaster as it travels further upstream. This effect is called the bullwhip effect. Remember Indiana Jones and his whip? The handle only moves a couple of inches, but the tip travels several feet. Any time the roller coaster goes up, there are costs involved. As demand increases, you ramp up production, put people on overtime, buy supplies at higher costs, expedite shipments, etc. With high demand, you are able to pass on these costs to your customers. Then, all of a sudden, the bottom falls out. Now you are selling all your inventory for 30 cents on the dollar. And all that new equipment that you added? How about 28 cents on the dollar? What do you say? You don't like the deal? Okay, my offer is now 27 cents on the dollar. Take it or leave it. We are company A, so why do we care if company D is on a roller coaster ride? Whether the roller coaster goes up or down, the costs of production increase for company D. Company D passes on its costs to company C, which passes on its costs to company B, which passes on its costs to us. We then pass on these costs to the end customer. It's a nice setup. Unfortunately, the customer has just discovered that our competitor operates differently. Our competitor shares detailed point-of-sale data with members of its supply chain so that they can base their forecasts and plans not on inaccurate assumptions but on actual demand. This demand is actually quite steady, so there is no unnecessary ramping up or down. All the supply chain partners are on the same page, so when the final demand sees a blip, all the companies go on the same blip and quickly return to normal. The costs in this supply chain are minimized and the end customer likes that. How does our competitor get away with sharing so much information with their suppliers? For one thing, they operate on long-term partnerships and don't switch suppliers very frequently. So there is a greater sense of loyalty, greater level of mutual trust, and less need for worrying about information being misused. But with such long-term partnerships, how do you keep the suppliers on their toes? Won't they just keep raising their prices? That is a potential threat, of course, but competitive bidding wars are not the only way to get the most value from the supplier relationship. With closer ties, pressure can be applied in different ways. For example, it is said that when Toyota asks for a cost cuts from its suppliers, it doesn't just demand them and walk away, but rather works closely to help the suppliers improve efficiencies. Also, while a competitive supplier orientation operates on a zero-sum or win-lose basis, a cooperative orientation operates on a win-win basis. An immediate win-win is in terms of avoiding the bullwhip effect. Even simple cooperation, limited to the extent of basic information sharing, can produce savings for both parties. In addition, by offering a long-term partnership to our supplier, we minimize our switching and monitoring costs. Meanwhile, they gain savings by having a steady customer and can offer us discounts. So both parties stand to benefit from the arrangement. Another kind of win-win relationship occurs with regard to early supplier involvement in new product design. Let us say we are designing a new product. It's all hush-hush at this stage. Under the competitive orientation, we want to keep everything under wraps from our supplier for as long as possible. Instead, how about we invite the supplier into our design team's discussions. We are going to be ordering a particular plastic part from our supplier. The supplier's engineer, who is an expert on plastics, takes one look at the part design 
and suggests that we use a different kind of plastic. This other plastic will handle wear and tear better and won't crack so easily. Also, if the radius of a particular curve could be changed slightly, the product will look and feel the same, but the production costs will be reduced by 5%. We thank the supplier's engineer for the valuable input and modify our design accordingly. But how come we didn't think of all this? Because we are not the experts on plastic. Why is the supplier's representative telling us all this? Because if our product is successful, they stand to share in our success.